Hi guys, Drea from Aloha Plant Life here, and today we are gonna be talking about all things variegation related. Variegated houseplants are some of the most popular houseplants that are out there, but a lot of people are unaware that there are multiple different types of variegation that present differently in plants, and more importantly, a lot of people don't realize that some of those types of variegation don't actually last. So today I'm gonna to take you guys through the five, what I like to call real types of variegation in plants, and we're gonna visit one at the end that I'm gonna call shady as shit type of variegation. And no, it's not the people out there painting their green monsteras with white paint and calling it an elbow, although those people do exist. But before we jump into the first type of variegation, even though this is gonna be a science-y type video, I just wanna let you guys know that I'm gonna keep the scientific jargon to a minimum. I also wanna remind everybody that I am not a botanist, so in no way, form, or fashion am I an expert on this topic. I did do all of my own research on this from reputable places, and I will link all the places that I researched from below in the description for you. But there is one sciencey term that you do need to know, so we're gonna get that out of the way first, and that is meristem. Meristem is just the scientific way of saying the growth tip or the growth point on a plant. In other words, the place on your plant where new leaves come in. I'm gonna be mentioning meristem quite a bit in this video because the cells in the meristem is where variegation happens. So let's go ahead and get into the first type of variegation that I wanna talk about today, and that is chimera variegation and I want to talk about this one first for several reasons but one is that it is one of the most common types of variegation that you're going to see in houseplants. Now chimeric variegation is a spontaneous type of variegation meaning that it just happens sometimes out of nowhere and because of that it is also highly unstable. This is the most unstable type of variegation there is, and I'll get into it a little bit more what I mean by unstable as we go along here, but let's talk about how this variegation looks when it happens. So when chimeric variegation spontaneously happens in the meristem of the plant, there ends up being two genetically different tissue types, and one of them actually has chlorophyll, which is what makes plants green, and one of them does not. So in chimeric variegation, that's why you will see plants that are green, and then also yellow or white, or maybe just a lighter shade of green. So think like your Monstera albos, that kind of thing. Now with chimeric variegation, there are actually three different subtypes of chimeric variegation. And some of those subtypes are less unstable than others. So by unstable, what I'm basically trying to tell you guys is any type of plant with chimeric variegation, regardless of which of these three subtypes it is, is likely to eventually revert back to its original form, which is an all green plant. Although sometimes when they do revert back, I have seen where they kind of take on like a muddy brown appearance, depending on what color variegation they had when they were variegated. But the fact of the matter remains that the plant has unstable variegation. It is very uncommon for it to last forever. And it really just depends on the specific plant as to how likely it is to revert and how fast. So we're gonna go through those three subtypes real quick. And I am gonna borrow some diagrams from some research that I found online that I think are gonna help you kind of understand more what I'm talking about. So the first subtype of chimeric variegation that I wanna talk about is called paraclinal. And this is the least unstable of the three. And so in the meristem, if you think about the plant as having like layers of skin, just like we do, in periclinal chimeric variegation, only one tissue layer or skin layer, if you will, of that plant leaf is going to have the mutated gene that causes that variegation. However, it will be throughout the entire layer of that tissue. So in this diagram, you can see that they're showing that will often present like variegation where you just have white around the edge of the leaf, but the center of the leaf remains green. So this also means that periclinal chimeric variegation presents much more symmetrical than the other two types that we're gonna talk about next. But let's go ahead and talk about the second type, and that type is called mericlinal chimeric variegation. So in the case of mericlinal chimeric variegation, it's the same as periclinal in the fact that only one tissue layer is affected, but in this case, the entire layer is not affected. Only part of it is affected. So as you can see in the diagram, they're showing this to be, for example, if you had a leaf where part of the edge was white but not all the way around and the center was still green. And this is a much more unstable version of this type of variegation because this is what is known as a transitional state. So basically this is a plant that has gotten this variegation which is coming from a mutated gene and it is not sure whether it's going to keep it or do away with it. And only time will tell. So basically a plant with this type of variegation will either revert back to an all green plant 
or that variegation will continue to spread to the point where it becomes paraclinal and it's throughout the entire layer. So the third subtype of chimeric variegation is called sectoral chimeric variegation. And in this situation, all of the tissue layers of the plant are affected, not just one like in the previous two types, but it also does not affect the entire layer of any of those tissue layers. So this presents itself in what is often known as a half moon variegation, where you see one side of a leaf being one color and the other side of the leaf being a completely different color. And this variegation type is relatively unstable. It is not as unstable as the mariclinal, but it is definitely more unstable than the paraclinal. Now with chimeric variegation, these plants cannot be recreated with that variegation by any means other than a cutting and propagation from a variegated part of that plant. It cannot be done via seed growth. It cannot be done in a lot of cases via stem or root growth because the variegation is strictly limited to certain leaves on that plant. Now is actually also a good time for me to probably point out to you guys why plants develop variegation spontaneously in the first place. It is largely believed that it is an evolutionary process in which they're kind of testing things out, if you will. So for example, it could be as a defense mechanism against pests. Maybe they discover that if they are more camouflaged looking that a pest thinks they're diseased or something, and now a pest won't want to come feed on them. Think along those kinds of lines. But when this does happen, whether or not it will become a permanent genetic type of variegation, which takes years and years and years, depends really on whether the plant perceives that it actually benefited it in some way. And it is possible for you to experience firsthand spontaneous chimerical variegation in your home, on your own house plants that were not variegated when you bought them. Case in point, I have my frost peperomia propagation here that spontaneously put out this beautiful variegated leaf here. And the mother plant is not variegated in the slightest. And there are some other leaves on this plant now that are picking up more of that chimeric variegation and in different ways. So I'm seeing some of the sectoral, I'm seeing some of the mariclinal. And so I'm really fascinated to see what happens with this plant, but odds are it's not gonna last and I know that, so I'm going to enjoy it while I can. But let's move on to our next type of variegation. And this is a stable type of variegation, which means that this variegation is not going to disappear on you. The plant is not going to revert. So this type of variegation is what is referred to as either reflective variegation or blister variegation. And the most common example of a plant with this type of variegation that I can show you is a Syndapsis exotica. And as you see here, this is my Syndapsis exotica with its silvery variegation. And this is a type of blister variegation. Now, if anybody owns one of these, you'll know that that variegation looks and feels slightly raised on the plant. I don't know how well it's gonna read on camera, but we'll try here. But basically what happens with this type of variegation is that top layer of the plant's leaf gets raised up due to the formation of a blister beneath the surface of that first layer. And since that upper layer is actually unpigmented, when light reflects through it, it causes it to look silver in nature. Now this type of variegation can also happen to the veins on a plant, not just the actual leaf surface itself. A good example of that is actually the Alocasia frydeck. This does have blister variegation running along all the veins on those leaves. Now when it comes to propagating plants with reflective, aka blister variegation, it does follow the plant. So it doesn't matter if you take a stem cutting, a root cutting, whatever it may be, that propagation will also have that blister variegation. So the third type of plant variegation I wanna to talk to you about is called transposon variegation. And this is another stable form of variegation, but it involves what they call a movable genetic element, which basically means that the genes can jump around. So if we're looking at a plant's leaf that has this type of variegation, it's typically gonna look splashy or splotchy in nature. And here I'm showing you an example of what is called a hypericone plant. And this has the transposons type of variegation on it. Now, just like with blister variegation, if you were to propagate this plant, the variegation will follow the propagation and you will have a variegated plant from that propagation. This plant, however, also can be grown from seed and still show up as variegated. So the fourth type of plant variegation I wanna talk about is pattern gene variegation. And this is 100% stable. It is built into the DNA of the plant. Basically when I was talking about plants testing out variegation over an evolutionary time period and deciding if it's going to stay, 
This is the result of that process. Pattern gene variegation is a very distinct type of variegation and it is unchanging in nature. It stays exactly how it is. So the plant that I showed you at the start of this video, that rattlesnake calathea, that is an example of pattern variegation and calathea and prayer plant family plants in general is where you're gonna see a lot of pattern variegation. I'm gonna grab my burl marks from behind me here. So this is my Tenanthe burl marksii, and this is pattern variegation. This plant will always look like this. The variegation does not change. The pattern does not change. It stays like this. If I divide this plant into other plants to propagate it, it's still gonna have this exact same type of variegation. And in my personal opinion, I actually think pattern variegation produces some of the most beautiful variegation that's out there on houseplants. But because it is common and stable, I almost feel like sometimes it's not appreciated as much because it's not considered to be as rare as a lot of the chimeric variegation you see on houseplants. But if we're talking about plants that are not in the prayer plant family that have pattern gene variegation, and you're kind of wondering, well, how do I know if it has pattern gene variegation or not? A good way to know is to look at both the leaves and the stems of the plant. If the stem is also variegated, like you are seeing here on my Marble Queen Pothos, that's a good sign that this is a pattern gene type of variegation and not just some form of chimeric variegation. And before we move on to our next type of variegation, I did want to take a moment to mention that you may hear people use the term Polaroid variegation from time to time. That is not really a scientific term, and basically all Polaroid variegation means is that the variegation takes time to fully express itself when a new leaf comes in. So kind of like when you take a Polaroid picture, you've got to sit there doing this for a while before the full color develops to what it will be permanently moving forward. So the fifth and last real form of variegation in plants that I want to talk about is called viral variegation, or also sometimes referred to as pathological variegation. This is when a plant has a virus that causes it to be variegated. Now there are viruses out there that will do this and it will kill the plant. However, scientists at one point recognized that some viral infections in plants and the associated variegation caused by them were desirable traits. So basically they went and they tried to reproduce this effect in a stable manner. And I say stable with quotes because it's a virus. It can be treated and then it would go away. You would lose the variegation. So some examples of plants with purposeful viral variegation, a big one that you're gonna see are hostas. They have a specific virus that makes them look this way and it was perceived it's desirable, so it's been reproduced that way. Another big one that I can think of off the top of my head are variegated tulips. That's actually caused by a tulip specific virus that makes those petals look variegated. But basically anytime you see this kind of variegation, it has been purposely done to the plant. And if it's been done correctly, it should never result in the death of a plant and it is going to remain stable as long as you don't do anything to treat the virus. Now before we move on to the one very shady form of plant variegation that I want to make you guys aware of, I also want to make you aware that a lot of the variegation that you see in houseplants today is the result of plant breeding by growers. And in the case of those types of plants, that's what's referred to as cultivars. And so a way to know whether a plant is a cultivar or whether it is a variegation that was just naturally occurring in nature is to look at the scientific name and how it is presented. So if it's not a cultivar, the second half of the scientific name should be in all lowercase and it should be italicized. And in this case, because we're talking about variegated plants, it's gonna say variegata. Now, if it's a cultivar, it will be presented in non-italics the V will be uppercase, the rest of the word variegata will be lowercase, and it will be in single quotations. Now, that being said, they often get misused and misrepresented by the average Joe. So take it with a grain of salt when you see it presented one way versus the other, but if you can find a scientific paper or a scientific reference on it, that should have it represented correctly so that you can know for sure if it's a cultivar or not. So the last type of variegation that I wanna to talk to you about that I wish I wasn't having to talk to you about because it's just so shady and I don't understand why anybody would do it, but growers can manipulate plants to have variegation by using chemicals or dyes. Perhaps one of the most notable cases of this in recent history was the big philodendron pink Congo scam. And yes, I'm gonna call it a scam because I feel like if you're not being upfront and forthright with the fact that you fed the plant chemicals to induce the pink in the plant, that's a scam. 
So basically these growers fed these philodendron this chemical and it caused the plant to stop producing chlorophyll and the leaves turned all pink. So people then went and bought this plant, but then over the course of about six to 12 months, the leaves started reverting back to green because the chemical started wearing off. The plant was no longer being fed that chemical and so the leaves started getting their chlorophyll back. To me, that is ridiculous. It's ridiculous, it's shady, it's scammy, it shouldn't happen, but just be aware that that is another way to induce variegation in a plant. I want to say variegation in a plant because I just don't even think that should be called variegation, period. So now that we've gone over all of the types of variegation, you might find yourself wondering, well, can a plant have more than one type of variegation at a time? I think it can. And part of the reason I think it can is because I think my salsa dancer hibiscus must have multiple types of variegation because of the very different types of leaves that I have shown you before and I'm showing you again now. I mean, you can look at these. Some of these have that splotchy appearance, like it's the transposons variegation. Some of them have the sectoral look with half of one leaf being green and half of it being another color. Some of them have just the pink outline around the leaf, which is kind of like the periclineal. I just feel like this plant must be rocking multiple types of variegation at the same time, but I could be wrong. Once again, I am not a botanical expert. But now that I've given you guys a better understanding of the different types of variegation, which by the way, if you've been enjoying this video so far, please don't forget to hit that like and or subscribe button down below. But now that you understand these various types, and more importantly, you now know that the most common type of variegation that you're gonna see in the house plant market is unstable and can revert back to its prior green form, I thought it would be beneficial to put together a video for you guys pointing out some of the most common and the most coveted variegated plants in the house plant market right now that are in fact unstable and highly likely to revert. And you can check that video out right here. Thanks for joining me today, you guys, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Aloha!